Hi there, my name is Ed Cutrell, and I'm really happy to welcome you to our webinar today, Designing Computer Vision Algorithms to Describe the Visual World to People who are Blind or Low Vision. I'm joined here today with Donna Garari, the Assistant Professor of School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. She is an expert in computer vision, machine learning, crowdsourcing, accessibility, and biomedical image analysis. Um, my name is Ed Cudrell, again. Um, I'm a senior principal researcher here at Microsoft um, in the Ability Group. And my focus is on computing for disability and accessibility and inclusive design. And in particular, I have a long career in human-computer interaction. Now, I want to remind you that if you're here for the initial broadcast, you can actually ask us some questions um, on the little webinar widget. So just make sure you do that. Let's start out talking a little bit about accessibility. Now, accessibility generally is a notion of how we provide options for people with different abilities to then be able to get done what they want to do. And this can apply to a range of different kinds of disabilities, from vision, hearing, cognitive disabilities, mobility, speaking. There's a big wide range of things that this might actually incorporate. But to understand this a little bit better, we need to think about disability. Now, there's been a huge change in how we define disability in just in the past 40 or 50 years. Now, if you go back to 1980 and you listen to the uh, World Health Organization and their definition of disability, they define it as any restriction or lack of ability resulting from an impairment to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Okay, so that's really framing it around a lack of ability there. Now, if you think about the way it is now, they refer to it as disability is not just a health problem. It's a complex phenomenon reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and features of the society in which he or she lives. So if we think about that a little bit better or in a slightly higher view, disability is just a mismatch between the abilities of a person and what they're really trying to do, the capability or the situation that they're in. So I want to make very clear that when we think about disability in this context, it's not a personal health condition. It's really a mismatch between what the person is able to do and the human interaction that they're expected to be doing to try to get what they're trying to get done. So let's think about this in an example. So we can often think about this on a spectrum, going from sort of long term of a disability to a very short term thing. Now, in the very longest term, you've got a congenital disability. Maybe you were born without use of your legs, in which case your mobility is impaired in a particular way for your entire life. There's an acquired disability where as you age, you become, have more and more trouble um, walking, for instance, so you need to use a walker for assistance. There's a temporary disability. So you break a leg and you need to use a, a roller to get around. And then there's a situational impairment. I need to move my kids around in a stroller at that point, right? Now, for all of these kinds of disabilities, you can have similar kinds of solutions or ways of um, meeting those things. And the classic example of this is a curb cut. Curb cuts are initially designed for people in wheelchairs, but then they actually are useful for a huge range of people along the spectrum of disability. Now, this is true for all different kinds of disabilities, not just a movement. It applies to seeing. You can imagine people that are blind, people that have cataracts, but then the cataracts can be removed and repaired, or maybe just a distracted driver. Many of the same situations apply to all three. The same thing for hearing. You have the case of a person who's deaf. You've got an ear infection, so I can't hear until that ear infection is cleared up. Or there's a case of a bartender in a really noisy space where they can't hear anything while they're in that space. And then similarly, you know, in the case of speaking, all the way from nonverbal, all the way up to just a very heavy accent. Now, when we think about how to design for people with disabilities, um, we really need to sort of think about this from this entire spectrum that I just talked about. And the in interesting thing is that by designing for people with the impairment, we automatically wind up building in benefits for a huge range of people. Another example of that, I showed you the curb cuts earlier, but another great example of this is subtitling and captioning. Now, this is a technology that was really built for people that are deaf and hard of hearing. 
But it turns out that this is extremely useful for people, in, for instance, in an airport, or now, more recently, with mobile phones. Facebook now includes captioning in almost all of their videos because people don't want to be bothering everyone around them, and they want to be able to still enjoy their cat videos. Um, and then another example is teaching a child to read, where there's been a lot of research showing that captioning that goes along with the sound can help children learn to read. So there's a case here of a technology that was built for people with a very specific long-term impairment that now applies to all kinds of people. So now let's get this back into maybe Microsoft land. Um, I work at Microsoft, and this is important and near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things that's happened recently is we've actually now um, released as part of PowerPoint the ability to automatically add alt text captioning to an image that you insert into um, PowerPoint. So in this case, this is a photograph of um, my darling kitten, Tarly. And um, he, the caption that's automatically generated by computer vision algorithm is a cat lying on the ground. That's actually a pretty good caption. And this is a really nice benefit of using computer vision technology to sort of start to benefit people that are um, visually impaired. So alt text, if just as to be clear about this for people who don't know it, this is the way that people who use screen readers, and this is where they read out information on a screen, can get information. Now, obviously, there are problems when they run across an image. How do they find out? Alt text is how you find out about what that image is actually saying. And you can imagine that if you don't have alt text, that you've got an entire class of information that just goes away for people that are visually impaired. Now, while this works really well in many instances, it also can start to fall over in other cases. Now, this is an example of an image that appeared in Twitter a few years ago when Hillary Clinton was running for president. So this was four years ago, and she writes this tweet that says, some on the other side may say the best days are behind us. Let's prove them wrong. And she's ascending the uh, stage with a big smile on her face, and it's great, right? Now, we ran this through an automatic captioning system, and the response was, I'm not really confident, but I think it's a man doing a trick on a skateboard at night. Now, in some level, you say that's just ridiculous. And of course, why would Hillary Clinton be um, using an image of a person on a skateboard? That just doesn't make any sense. But in fact, when we talked with blind users who use Twitter regularly about this image and about this caption, this is what they had to say. There was actually no question. They just assumed that the caption was correct. And they said, well, you know, if you say there's an older man on a skateboard at night, that makes sense. And that's the way I take our best days are behind us, because I'm an old lady. So I like that idea. So what you can see is that even though this captioning had some problems with it that are kind of obvious to people that are sighted and can see it, if you're blind, you may actually start to believe that and just try to make up a story about why that's true. So this just starts to point at how important this area is and how getting these captions right are really, really important for people that can't see. So I just want to sort of close up this little section on accessibility by talking, by mentioning that computer vision offers us an incredible set of capabilities, and they have the, the potential to improve the lives of millions and millions of people. Now, the problem that we have to be careful about is that the tools have to be matched to what the people want and need, and allows them to build in their own capabilities and not just what we're trying to do for them. So with that, what I want to do is to bring up Donna, who's going to talk about the specific issue here that we're going to talk about around using computer vision and captioning. So, driven by the desire to support real users, we decided to embark on helping real users who rely on on-demand visual assistance. So at present, people who are blind can take their mobile phone, take a picture, optionally record a spoken question, and have that sent off to remote humans, who in turn will either return a caption or an answer if a question was provided. An example looks like this, given an image, a caption might say, a bunch of small light brown mushrooms in a green field. Or given a question, is it edible or poisonous? You might answer, poisonous. This kind of technology has existed now for about a decade, and we've observed 
an increasing number of technologies that are emerging to support this kind of scenario. The goal of our work is how do we teach computers to automatically describe these pictures taken by people who are blind? So let's take a view of what is the typical pipeline for training computer vision algorithms to see. It takes three steps. First, build a large scale data set. Second, design an algorithm, train it, evaluate it. And finally, take that algorithm and deploy it for real users. And if we zoom into those first two steps with an example, this is analogous to how you might teach a child. So if you wanna show a child an image and ask, is there a person in the image? You might do this by showing the child many examples where there are people in different sizes, shapes, configurations, and more. So this is what we do today with algorithms. We train algorithms by showing them as many examples as possible. There are several problems with this pipeline today. One is that there's often a mismatch between real users' needs and what is used in the data sets. Two is that we consequently will have a mismatch between the algorithms and their ability to handle the data sets. And then the third is that it turns out that the kinds of problems we're thinking about aren't necessarily covered by today's computer vision methods. So thinking about what are the new problems we need to address. So I'm gonna go through these three examples for the remainder of the talk. So diving into the first one. What I show here are three examples on the top from the existing data set used by the community, three examples on the bottom from real users. And prior work has predominantly been collecting the pictures and the questions independently. Pictures are collected from the internet, questions are contrived, often generated by a person who has shown the image and asked to ask a question. So you'll see a bias where many of the questions note what is in the image, such as, is the bus moving? In contrast, real users are a scenario where it's the same person who took the picture and asked the question. And data reflects real users' interests, such as learning the flavor of food, the temperature on a thermostat, as well as whether or not their sneakers match. So the first effort that we took in solving this challenge is we decided to make a data set. We worked off of an existing repository of data where over 11,000 people submitted over 72,000 requests between 2011 and 2015, and we used 62% of the requests for which users agreed to share their data. This data came from real users, so it was very important to make sure that we kept their identities private. So we took steps such as anonymizing the data by transcribing the questions to remove their voices, as well as resaving the images to remove any metadata such as their location. We next came up with a way to remove all personally identifiable information. So we came up with a taxonomy of what is private information and then went through all the images to remove any that contain that information. And tax, the taxonomy includes people's faces, their prescription pills, as well as their mail that might show their address or their personal information. And then we took those remaining images we went to online crowd workers with Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we, co we collected captions and answers. The results is two new data sets, a visual question answering data set, for which we have 10 answers for every visual question, as well as an image captioning data set, for which we have five captions for every image. This is, data set is very challenging for the community for a number of reasons, including that many of the images are low quality, Many contain text, and many contain novel caps concepts such as showing currency or showing CAPTCHAs. And it turns out many of these participants are also taking a lot of pictures of Kellogg branded food. Um, and so far as exploring this data set, we encourage you to hop onto our website and check it out. You can look at the images, you know, a sample of the images that we're taking as is being showed on the screen. You can also click on any image to see what question was asked, what do the town crowdsource answers look like, as well as what do the captions look like. On the, your left side, you can also see that there's a search bar that allows you to search for specific concepts. 
in the questions as well as the answers and the captions as well as more metadata. Given that we produced a data set, we next wanted to explore the uh, design of algorithms that match the data set challenges. So to do this, I'm just going to kind of outline what is the typical approach for evaluating algorithms. Uh, so we have a data set. In this case, we have a bunch of images with questions and then answers. So I show this in abstract form. And the way we typically evaluate is we would take that data set, split it into a training set and a test set. Then train the algorithm on the training set to try to minimize some prediction error on it. And then take that train model and apply the algorithm on the test set to, minimize, to measure the generalization error. So for example, if we have these two examples, we would take that algorithm, apply it to the first one. We'd see it's a matching predicted caption or answer. Do it for the second one, see it's incorrect. We do that for all the examples tally all the results, and then come up with a score saying how well the methods did. So we did this for three different scenarios. In the first scenario, we looked at what happens when we train today's state-of-art algorithms using today's state-of-art uh, computer vision data sets. And we evaluated with respect to a number of different measures. Without going into the details, here's the results. In a nutshell, they don't do well. So then we said, well, maybe the algorithms are right. Maybe it's just that they weren't trained on the right data. So we next tested what happens when we take those algorithms and we train it on the data from people who are blind. So we did that. This shows that there is a slight improvement. Overall, we see a rise in scores. But nonetheless, we see the algorithms are still not doing well across the many metrics. So we did a final test, which said, we're going to train the data. We're going to train those algorithms on both the old data sets and the new data sets and see how it does. Yet again, we're not getting good results. So in a nutshell, today's algorithms are not sufficient. Um, here is an example of a mistake. Given this image, this is the outcome from an algorithm, which believes that it's a man who is holding his head on a cell phone. Clearly not correct. And so just to reiterate, what, what's challenging about this data set for algorithms it's that many images are low quality, contain text, and have novel concepts. So to make progress on this important problem, we've actually shared all of our data sets publicly to engage a larger community to accelerate progress. So you can find the data sets again at our website. We also have our data set being shared in other locations, such as Academic Torrents, Kaggle, and Facebook's platform. And in addition, we're providing a public evaluation server with leaderboards to monitor how different teams are doing. So you can see a current list of all the participants with the ranking of how they stand on the international stage. We invite everyone to come and join in. We are organizing events to foster a community and celebrate progress. We had the last event in 2018, and we do have our next event in 2020. And so we invite others to come and join on this challenge and make progress. And the progress is being celebrated by many who are writing articles about this data set, as well as their success on making progress on this data set. So now let's dive into the third key challenge, which is revealing users' new problems. So again, we have this pipeline where people are submitting their images with optionally questions and wanting to get captions or answers. But if we take a look at the user's data, we see that several issues are emerging. The first is that 9% of over the 39,000 images we analyzed have quality issues that are too severe to recognize the content, meaning forget trying to get some sort of caption to describe that image. We probably should notify the user, hey, try to take another image. We also found that 29% of the uh, 31,000 visual questions we an uh, analyzed are not answerable. So for example, with the question, what is the expiration date, the picture does not capture that information within the image. And this is true for the other examples, such as what is this a gift card for? What temperature is the dial set to? And then 
the next challenge is that 12% of all the images that we analyzed show private content. Private content can include showing people's faces, credit card numbers, pregnancy test results, information on computer screens, as well as information about their prescription pills. And of these privacy disclosures, one out of every 40 were intentional. Because people needed to learn about their private content, they took the trade-off of sharing their private information in order to get that information. So we also are introducing a number of new problems with data set challenges to address these new problems we should be thinking about as a community. One is, given an image, decide whether or not that content can be recognized. Another is, given a question about an image, decide whether it can be answered. And then the next one is, given an image, decide whether it contains private content. And as before, all these data sets are going to be publicly shared at our website. And so that summarizes the work we are working on to teach computers to automatically describe pictures taken by people who are blind. As I noted, there are some key problems with the data set, the algorithms, and really understanding the real user's needs that hopefully we've inspired you to want to move forward with. So to summarize, we offer our new data set challenges, which empower the AI community to work on real use cases. Our algorithm analysis reveals open technical challenges for the AI community. And our data set analysis reveals new important AI problems for supporting real users. There are many people who have been involved in the work that we are presenting today. Um, some include our mentees with little images shown in the right, our colleagues, there are many who have supported the development of these data set challenges. And there's also thousands of crowd workers who have dedicated tens of thousands of hours towards helping make this possible. And so I want to close with inviting you to join our challenges to design more generalized algorithms that address real users' needs. As I mentioned, we are having a workshop in 2020. It will be in Seattle. And we'll be announcing the winners of our data set challenges. And at this time, I'd love to invite you to join us for a live Q&A. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Ed Cutrell. I want to thank you all for attending our webinar and live Q&A on designing computer vision algorithms for describing the visual world to people who are blind or low vision. Um, I'm joined here today with Donna Garari, and over the next 15 minutes or so, we'll be answering questions that are submitted by the audience, all of you folks. So let's get started. Um, our first question today is about, let me get, get my list of questions here. There was a question early on that um, was talked about about are there places where technology that's developed for some disability might actually cause problems for other people? Um, this is a really good question, and it's it's a, a deep question about the ethics of the way we build these AI models. Donna, would you like to address this? Absolutely. Um, so a number of examples come to mind. People want image captioning whether they are traversing a um, if they're looking at a newspaper, or if they're on a dating website, or if they're on a shopping website. And an example where the technology might present concerns, you might think about on a dating website where someone's going on, they would like some sort of guidance of what they're seeing on the people, and a technology might provide some sort of details about the person's characteristics. This could include things like their, you know, the presumed race, a presumed gender, a presumed body shape, um, a presumed attractiveness, and more. And that's highly controversial. Uh, some people would claim they would want those details, while others would claim that's, you know, that's unethical to provide. And so there are certainly a lot of discussions and decisions that have to be made about how much do you portray about the visual world. Um, and whether it's ethical to not share such details versus is it ethical to share it knowing technology might be biased and racist and other concerning things. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Donna. Um, so we have another question here that um, is asking, when an image cannot be analyzed because it's a bad image, the algorithm should also suggest what the user might need to do to improve it, like maybe move a little to the right or um, something like that. And the question is, is that part of the algorithm challenge? Yes. We have a number of challenges because it turns out, uh, so in the case of image captioning, um, we have a challenge that will be coming out. Um, it will, the paper should be publicly available over the next week. Uh, it will be posted to archive and it will be published as part of the set of papers for CBPR 2020 about assessing the image quality. One side of that is if someone is trying to post a picture to social media, that person might want to make sure it looks high quality and want some sort of feedback from the algorithm of, you know, did I appropriately center the person in the image or the scene or something else to that effect. And so we are putting out a challenge on that front that supports, um, that has algorithms that can tell a user whether the images are blurry, if they're too bright, they're too dark, um, if the view is rotated, and so give some sort of fine-grained information to help that photographer make certain adjustments. We also are releasing with that work um, a data set that supports the design of algorithms that lets uh, a person learn whether or not that image is of sufficient quality to be captured. So sometimes an image is just taken and it's just all black, it's all white, it's just way too blurry, and a sighted viewer can't even make out what is the content of the image. And in that case, it's nice to fail fast, to have an algorithm say, hey, look, this image isn't bright quality, let's try to take another one again. Um, so that's on the image captioning side. We also have in our challenge on the visual question answering side, the task of being able to design algorithms that will immediately tell a user whether or not the question that that person asked about the image is answerable. A, a question about an image may be unanswerable because the image is low quality, as described before, but it can also be the case because the content of interest is missing from the image. As an example, uh, a lot of questions ask, looking at some food, what is the expiration date of that food? And often uh, it can be the case when someone takes an image that that expiration date is not even visible in the scene. And in that case, you would want the user to try to take the picture again. Um, and I guess I'll just close on that section saying, please visit our website at bizwiz.org and you can find all these data sets with challenges for doing assistive photography on that website. Awesome, thanks Donna. Um, so there's a question here that I'll, I can take. There's a, a few different questions here that are around to um, the geographic or um, sort of cultural specificity of these kinds of systems. And the questions really are like, one of the questions is, does the data set have geographic tagging in it? And I think the answer to this data set is no, because of the privacy issues associated with it. But it is certainly the case that you could imagine that having some kind of information about where the images are taken can be very helpful in parsing and understanding what might be going on there. So for instance, an image, images that are taken in India or Egypt are likely to be very different kinds of images than are gonna be taken in South Africa or taken in Paris. Um, and these kinds of things can be useful in improving the recognition or in the way in which we present captioning associated with it because you're going to have different kinds of, of information there. But for this data set, we needed to take all that out because of the privacy issues associated with this kind of geotagging. Is that right, Donna? Yes, that does sound right. Great. Thank you. So uh, I am looking at the questions and I see another question here saying, it's talking more on the technical side and it's talking about that there's classification data sets like ImageNet, which are very rich as far as visual information and details. Um, and the question is, 
can we make use of these classification data sets to help detection and captioning problems? So we were interested in the exact same question when we put out this captioning data set. And so we actually did a thorough analysis to figure out what is the overlap between the objects that are being described by users shown images taken by people blind and the objects that are found in the classification data sets, such as ImageNet, as well as a number of other popular consideration data sets. And so at, you know, over, as an overview, all that data set is now available, all that analysis is now available on archive in a paper that will be on visvis.org. Um, but in a nutshell, we find there's about 50% overlap. Um, sorry, let me step back. There's much less overlap. There's a uh, very small overlap in terms of the kinds of objects that are described in the images that are taken by people blind versus the kinds of objects that are found in those classification data sets. And so what that tells us is that even if you have an amazing architecture that you train on today's existing data sets, they're going to probably not do well on these novel images taken by people who are blind because there's a big mismatch in the kind of content. And so um, there is some ability to leverage existing data sets, but there's, it will only help a very narrow sliver of the interest that people who are, that we see within the images we're working with. So Donna, there's two questions here about these. This is just to extend this a little bit about the data sets. And the, the question is, um, are there, is there a capability to add more images into the data set, either because you were just trying to expand it or to provide um, things that are more general for particular regions? You know, the, one of the observations here is that many of these things were taken in the USA, and so any of the algorithms that are developed are likely to be more um, appropriate for the U.S. or European context, as opposed to, say, um, Africa or Asia, or et cetera. How are there, is there plans or is there a way to expand these data sets more to create more of the images? Yes, um, excellent question. I was thrilled to see this past year that a new paper came out introducing a new data set that was collected using um, pictures taken by people who are blind in South Korea. So that is available and live today. Um, and I'll have to, I'm, I was looking on Google Scholar to see if I could quickly find it, but going through how was that collected? How do we start to think about how do we enlarge this data set? Uh, that's a key challenge that this team was able to address. And what they did is they went ahead and built an application using the mobile phone um, that supports a user to record a spoken question, take a picture, and have those submitted. And what the team that put this data together did is they beforehand uh, paid people who are blind and I believe low vision as well to use this app in their daily lives and to submit the data. And those people signed a waiver and agreed to be part of providing a solution to help them meet their daily needs. So these people very willingly and knowingly understood that they were going to share their data to try to help the advancements of technology. And while it's a bit different from what happened from VizWiz, because in the VizWiz case, people were immediately getting answers to their questions from online crowd workers, it's it still supports this generation of a larger scale data set and it absolutely addresses the need for us to go beyond a US centric environment and really think about what are the needs from people all across the world. So that is one promising direction. And I guess, you know, I think we need to continue to think creatively on the front of how do we continue to expand the sizes of these data sets. So there's a question here about designing neural networks here, which, which work for the problem. And uh, the question is just, is it trial and error by just adding extra layers or tuning hyperparameters randomly? Or, you know, is there a, 
uh, a best practice for trying to start to develop these kinds of, of algorithms. And maybe the right answer here is just to start pointing people to some of the, the um, papers where this is being effective, I guess. Yeah, so, you know, there's certainly in the machine learning way of thinking a lot of trial and error. I would say we are going to great lengths to try to provide metadata so we can start to decipher what is hard versus easy for algorithms. And so I'll give you an example. One part of our metadata is flagging for each image whether or not text is present in an image, right? So today's image captioning algorithms are trained on images that don't typically have text in them, okay? So we wouldn't expect for today's image captioning algorithms to do well in that environment. And intuitively, we might go into this problem thinking, absolutely, we need to put in some sort of optical character recognition mechanism into the algorithm design. Um, and so to support this analysis to see was our hypothesis correct, we both analyzed the algorithms overall, overall, as well as looking at how do algorithms perform on those images that don't have text, and how do algorithms perform on those images that do have text. And we found a very surprising finding, which is that algorithms actually do better on images that have text. So that evoked for us a natural question of why would that be? These tools, there's no reason to believe they can read what's going on in the images. And what we believe is going on is that algorithms for captioning the images are doing well because they typically can follow an overall trend of a person is holding a bottle that says something, okay? So maybe they can get most of the caption right without getting the details of what uh, the text within it. Um, maybe, you know, typically people are holding something when they are trying to have text read from an object, okay? So that was a surprising finding, uh, but it also tells us kind of a future direction, which is you can get far with existing image captioning algorithms. That doesn't necessarily mean you're providing the information that's of interest to this population. And so, yes, we need to add in text analysis capabilities. Um, and we have done similar analysis across other variables. So looking at with metadata about the quality of images, as well as the type of quality flaws that are present, as well as, um, yeah, we just have a number of various metadata, and I would encourage people to stay tuned onto our visvis.org because that is a growing uh, list of metadata that we are providing. And all that is searchable, I'd like to add, through our VizWiz dataset browser. You can see the various kind of metadata that's available to help kind of start to tease out what makes these problems hard for modern architectures and what kinds of modules we might need to add. Cool. So um, there's a question that is, is kind of useful here, which I, which I think is, is especially interesting for this kind of work, because most of the analysis that we're doing are, is based on crowds and providing a lot of the detail to ground truth on this. There's an interesting question around biases associated with these crowds. Can you talk about that a little bit, Donna? Yes, that is a great question. So a lot of these data sets are built on relying on, you know, taking an image and asking some online worker from, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk to describe that image or given the image with a question, provide an answer. The challenge is that People who are working on these platforms are not necessarily familiar with what are the interests of people who are taking the pictures. So I'd like to provide an example to paint this picture. So um, an image we had, we had almost total agreement from five different people from this crowdsourcing platform in describing this image. And what each of them said was something along the lines of, a person is wearing a green shirt with white text that says the following. So 
people all more or less agreed on what should be the, the description of this image. However, if you look at the question that the person wanted answered about the image, the question was, is this shirt dirty or clean? Okay. There are many more examples like that, including pictures of toilets, bathtubs, and descriptions usually describe what the, you know, it's a toilet or it's a bathtub and, or, you know, this isn't a very interesting image for just captioning. But what the person wants to know again in those cases is, is this clean? They just probably tried to clean these, um, you know, the, their bathroom or their house and they want to know, did I do a good job or they're running? And so that's just one layer of example, but more generally, there can be a mismatch in understanding from these crowd workers in terms of what is it that people who are blind actually want described in these images. And so I'd like to add to that that we are currently undergoing user studies to interview people who are blind and we have our first publication out. Uh, it will be discussed at, it's part of the CHI 2020 literature, but it's actually directly going to a select group of people with visual impairments and asking them what do you want described? And so we are trying to get some traction so we can provide templated um, instructions to crowd workers going forward to really help crowd workers figure out how to provide the information that is wanted. And so hopefully in the next couple of years, a new data set will be coming out in, in that way. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like we have time for maybe one more question, and um, I'm going to choose a question here that is goes back to the beginning of the webinar when we talked about inclusive design. And fundamentally, it's asking how do our findings generalize but beyond just supporting people who are blind and low vision? So I'm going to take a first swing at this, and then I'm going to – I think Donna has some really great ideas on this as well. And I would say that – from my perspective, one of the things about this work is that it's fundamentally about taking imperfect images or images that are taken in particular context or particular reasons why people are taking these images and then responding to that rather than overall kind of perfect images that um, – say, an MS Coco, et cetera, might be taken. And the reason why that's really important for generalized use is that most people are not taking perfect photographs whenever they want to understand what's going on in the world. And whether that is because you're blind or because your car is trying to understand objects in the road or because any kind of computer vision system is likely going to have particular context or reasons why they're there. And so that data that is, that is generated for those contexts is going to be really particular. And so the techniques that we learn to use for people that are blind and low vision can apply much more broadly across this big spectrum of other kinds of computer vision uses. And indeed, I think many other kinds of artificial intelligence tasks. No, Donna, what do you think? Yes, I 100% agree. And just to extend that even further, our data sets are the first data sets that allow us to do some sort of fine-grained analysis to understand how our algorithm is doing when working on a low-quality image versus a high-quality image. Because we provide metadata where you can separate out the low-quality from the high-quality and then analyze algorithms. Similarly, as I mentioned before, it allows for us to look at when images have text versus not. And so our data set offers the ability to explore these challenges that are really abounding around the world. And some specific examples I can think of that are very relatable to what we have learned from this data set is this new trend of wearable lifelong e-devices. Um, certainly these issues are prevalent for autonomous vehicles and robots. And I would also talk about, you know, we, we discussed the issue of privacy and with coronavirus, a lot of us are now sitting behind our computers doing meetings that possibly are being recorded and have lots of private information that are now being captured, you know, ranging from uh, pictures of your face to things in your house that you may not want to be publicly shared. And so while this data set was collected from one population, I very much believe we will find that 
what we are learning from this data set will have lots of potentially positive impacts on society at large. Awesome. All right. I think that with that, we are going to call this uh, good. I want to thank you all very much for attending today. We really do appreciate your, your participation and your interest in the domain. If you're interested in learning more, I want to remind you that we have some great resources in the resource list to the right of your screen. And this list includes links to the VizWiz data set, the workshop coming up in June, and a number of other goodies, including our websites, where there are lots of publications associated with that. We're really looking forward to seeing how you build on this research and evolve how computer vision can be used for people who are blind. We are really passionate about this area, as you can probably tell, and we would love to have more great minds from all over the world attacking it. I hope you have a great day and good luck.